This talk is a little bit hazardous. We're going to see some things that might tickle your brain. We're going to look at some images that might be a little distressing, although it won't be entirely clear why they're distressing. But we'll talk about why, and we'll also talk about some things that we don't talk about. And all kinds of things tend to float downriver when you open locks like that. So I want you to be here for it, which means if you can't be here for it, then take care of yourselves. Otherwise, hi. My name's Ashi, and I'm a senior software engineer at GitHub, which has nothing whatsoever to do with the talk you're about to hear. Because today, I want to talk about a hobby. I want to share with you some of what I've learned at the intersection of computational neuroscience and artificial intelligence. For years, I've been fascinated by how our bodies make experiences, how we perceive, how this machinery of ours results in qualitative sense, and why are our experiences shaped in the way that they are? Why do we feel exquisite joy? Why do we suffer? And I've also been fascinated by AI, which I think we all have. We're watching these little robots become better and better at approximating the tasks of our cognition, sometimes in unsettling ways. And so today, I want to share with you some of what I've learned. Some of it is solid research, and some of it is solid speculation. And all of it speaks to a truth that I have come to believe, that we are computations and our worlds are created on a computer that is ancient and powerful beyond imagining. So let's begin. Part one, hallucinations. This person is Mikel Pereo Nieto, and he has something to show us. It starts with these simple patterns, splotches of light and dark, like images from the first eyes. And this is going to give way into lines and colors, curves and more complex shapes. We are diving through the layers of the Inception image classifier, and it seems that there are whole worlds in here. Shaded multichromatic hatches, the crystalline farm fields of an alien world, the cells of plants. To understand where these visuals are coming from, Let's take a look inside. The job of an image classifier is to reshape its input, which is a bunch of pixels, into its output, which is a probability distribution. The probability that the image contains a cat, the probability of a dog, a person, a banana, a toaster. It performs this reshaping through a series of convolutional filters. And convolutional filters are basically Photoshop filters. Each neuron in a convolutional layer has a receptive field, some chunk of the previous layer that it's watching. And each convolutional layer applies a filter. Specifically, this filter is an image kernel, just a matrix of numbers where each number represents the weight of an input pixel. So we multiply each of the values in the receptive field by the weight, and we sum them to get this neuron's output value. Now, this filter is learned during training, and the same filter is applied across all neurons in a layer. We feed the classifier a labeled image, something where we know what's in it, and it outputs predictions. And then we math, we figure out how wrong those predictions were. And then we math again, figuring out how to change the filter in the direction that would make them more correct. And this process is gradient descent. In Deep Dream, we invert this. So this visualization is recursive. We start out with that photo of Mikel, and then to compute the next frame, we feed the current frame into the network. We run it through the network's many layers until we activate the layer that we're interested in, and then we math. How could we adjust the input image to activate this layer more? And then we adjust the image in that direction. The term for this is gradient ascent. So finally, we scale the image up very slightly before feeding it back to the network. This prevents uh, inception from fixating on the same patterns in the same places, and it also creates this really wild zooming effect. 
So every 100 frames, we move to a deeper layer or a layer to the side. Inception, it turns out, has quite a lot of layers, and they're not in a linear stack. And that gives us this. So we started with these rudiments of light and shadow. And deeper, we have this city of Kodamas thing happening. And then shortly, we're going to enter the spider observation area in which spiders observe you. But it's OK, because the spiders are going to become corgis. <laughs> And then the corgis are going to become the 70s. Later, we have a space of almost human eyes, which are going to become dog slugs, and then dog slug birds. Here, there was an unfortunate saxophonist teleporter accident. And finally, down here, we have entered fully the flesh zones with a side of lizard. So when I first saw this, I thought to myself that it looked like nothing so much as Donald Trump. And I resolved to never tell anyone that until I showed my roommate this video and she said exactly the same thing, which I think has more to do with the state of our neural networks than this one. Um, I think the lizard juxtaposition is really suggestive. But I do want you to notice and think about what it means that all of this flesh is so white. So this is all, yeah, it's pretty trippy, isn't it? What does that mean? What does it mean for something to be trippy? To figure that out, let's take a look inside ourselves. Meet Scully. Scully doesn't need all this cruft. We just care about Scully's visual system, our visual system, which starts here in our retinas. Your retinas, our retinas, are pretty weird. So light comes in, and it immediately hits this membrane. There's a layer of ganglions after the membrane, which are not particularly photoreceptive, although some of them are a little bit. Beneath them is a layer of stuff that does important things. And then at the back of your retina are all the photoreceptors, rods and cones, which sense luminance and color. So light comes in, and it winds its way through these four layers of tissue. It hits a photoreceptor, which gets excited. And that sends its signal out where exactly? So it sends it to a ganglion, and then the ganglion has to send it down the optic nerve, which is here. It's like routed right through the center of the eye. So our eyes are sensors that are mounted backwards with a hole drilled through the center of them. And it's all kind of OK, because we can patch it up later in software. So there's a couple of other problems here. One, you have 120 million rods and 6 million cones in your eye. And you have about 10 times fewer ganglions than that. So there's a significant mismatch in the carrying capacity and the number of receptors. And two, it gets worse. Because if you do the calculations, your optic nerve can carry about 10 megabits. That's its bandwidth. So we're trying to push the signal from this 100 megapixel camera through a pipe that's slower than Wi-Fi. And our retinas do what you might do if you're faced with such a problem. They compress. So each ganglion has a receptive field, it connects to about 100 photoreceptor cells. These are divided into a central disk and a surrounding region center and surround. So when there's no light on the entire thing, the ganglion doesn't fire. And when the whole field is illuminated, it fires weakly. And then your ganglions are divided kind of into two species. One species, when only the surround is illuminated and the center is dark, it fires very strongly. And in the other arrangement, does not fire at all. The other half of your ganglions behave in exactly the opposite way. They fire strongly when the center is bright and the surround is dark. So taken together, the behavior of these ganglions that are intermixed constitutes an edge detection filter. We are doing processing even in our eyeballs, and that processing allows us to downsample the image from our photoreceptors 100 times while retaining vitally important information, namely where the boundaries of objects are. 
So then the signal goes into the brain. It hits the optical chiasma, where the data streams from the left and right eyes cross, giving us 3D stereo vision. It's processed by the thalamus, which is a whole signal processing center, kind of a union station for your brain. And all manner of things happen there. Amongst other things, your thalamus runs your eyes autofocus, something which you probably noticed that you have, but maybe never noticed that you have. Each step of the signal processing pathway is extracting a little something. And that's all before we get all the way back here to the visual cortex. <clears throat> So our visual cortex is arranged into a stack of neuronal layers. The signal stays pretty spatially coherent throughout these layers, and so there is some slice of tissue in the back of your head that is responsible for pulling faces out of this part of your visual field, more or less with the kind of slop that we've come to expect from any neural network, biological or artificial. Each neuron in the visual cortex has a receptive field, some chunk of the entire visual field that it's looking at. And neurons in a given layer of the cortex respond similarly to signals within their receptive field. And that operation, distributed over a layer of neurons, performs some sort of feature extraction on the signal. First, we extract simple features, like patterns of light and dark and colors and edges, and then more complex features like surfaces, gradients, objects, eyes, and motion. It's no accident that we see the same behavior in inception, because convolutional neural networks were designed after the construction of our, neural, of our visual cortex. So our visual cortex is, of course, different from inception in many ways. Inception is a straight shot through, one pass input to output. Our visual cortex, however, contains feedback loops, these pyramidal neurons that connect deeper layers to earlier ones. These feedback loops let the results of deeper layers inform the behavior of previous layers. So for example, we might turn up the gain of edge detection along the boundary of what has later been detected as an object. <clears throat> this lets our visual system adapt and focus, not optically, but attentionally. It gives us the ability to ruminate on visual input well before we become consciously aware of it, improving our predictions over time. You know this feeling, thinking you see one thing and then realizing it's something else. So these loopback pyramidal cells in our visual cortex, they're covered in all kinds of receptors, and particularly they're covered in serotonin receptors. So different kinds of pyramidal cells respond to serotonin differently, but generally, they find it exciting. And don't we all? You might be familiar with serotonin from its starring role as the target of typical antidepressants, which are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. When serotonin is released into the brain, they make it stick around longer, thereby treating depression. Some side effects may occur. Most serotonin is actually located in your gut where it controls bowel movement. It signals to your gut that it's got food in it and it should go on and do whatever it is that it does to food. And that seems to be what it signals throughout your body, resource availability. And for animals with complex societies like ours, resources can be quite abstract, social resources as well as energetic ones. That your pyramidal cells respond excitedly to serotonin suggests that we focus on that which we believe will nourish us. So it's not correct as a blanket statement to say that pyramidal neurons respond excitedly to serotonin. In fact, there's different kinds of serotonin receptors and their binding tends to have different effects. So 5-HT1A receptors tend to be somewhat inhibitory. 5-HT3 receptors are interesting. In the brain, they're associated with sensations of anxiety and queasiness. And in the gut, they make it run backwards. Anti-nausea drugs are commonly 5-HT3 antagonists. Now, there's another kind of serotonin receptor, one that the pyramidal cells in your brain find particularly exciting. This is the 5-HT2A receptor. This is the primary target for every known psychedelic drug. It is what enables our brains to create psychedelic experiences. So you go to a show, 
and you eat a little piece of paper. And that piece of paper makes its way down to your stomach where it dissolves, releasing molecules of lysergic acid diethylamide into your gut. Now, LSD doesn't bind to 5-HT3A receptors, so if you feel butterflies in your stomach, it's likely just because you're excited, because you know what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is this. LSD is going to diffuse into your blood. It has no trouble crossing the blood-brain barrier, because it's tiny, but it's powerful, like you. It will diffuse deep into your brain, where it, into your visual cortex, where it will find a pyramidal neuron and find one of the HT2A receptors and lock into place. Once there, LSD stays bound for around 221 minutes. That's four hours, which is a very long time in the land of binding and ligands. They think that this extracellular protein, EL2, snaps in and forms a lid over top of it, trapping LSD inside, which would help explain why it's so very potent, with typical doses about 1,000 times less than other drugs. So while it's rattling around in there, the little LSD molecule is stimulating a feedback loop in your visual cortex. It is sending the signal, pay attention. What you're looking at is interesting. It may be nourishing. And so the pattern-finding machinery in your brain starts to run overdrive and at different rates. In one moment, the pattern in a tapestry seems to extend into the world beyond it. In another, it's the trees that are growing and breathing, their perception of movement, a visual hypothesis that's been allowed to grow wild. With Deep Dream, we asked what would excite some layer of inception, and then we adjusted the input image in that direction. Now, there's no comparable gradient descent process in the biological psychedelic experience. And that's because we're not looking at an input image. We're looking at the output of the network. We are the output of the network. The output of our visual cortex is a signal carrying visual perceptions, these kind of protoqualia that will be integrated by circuits elsewhere in your brain into your next moment of conscious experience. Now, inception never gets that far. We never even run it all the way to the classification stage. We never ask it what it sees in all this. But we could. In fact, we could perform this amplification process not on an intermediate layer, but on a final result. Maybe we ask, what would it take for you to see this banana as a toaster? Or say, don't these two skiers kind of, kind of look like a dog? So these are adversarial examples, images that have been tuned to give classifiers frank hallucinations, the confident belief that they're seeing something that just isn't there. And they're not completely wild, these robot delusions. I mean, that sticker really, really looks like a toaster, and it is very shiny. And those skiers, I mean, OK, they, like the body of the dog, you can kind of see it in the mountains, and their heads are kind of, that guy's kind of its tail. It's, OK, it's, it's pretty tenuous. But a person might, might, if they're far away, and they're tired, and they're high, think that looking at those two skiers, they're seeing a big dog. But they probably would not conclude that it's a big dog. Because the recurrent properties of our visual cortex, not to mention the whole rest of our brains, mean that our sense of the world is stateful. It is a continuously refined hypothesis whose state is held by the state of our neurons. Preparing us for capsule networks, Lisa Sabora writes, a parse tree is carved out of a multi-layer neural network, like a sculpture is carved from rock. So our perceptions are this process of continuous refinement, which may point the way to more robust recognition architectures, recurrent convolutional neural networks that can ruminate upon their input, making better classifications, or at least providing a signal that something is wrong. There are adversarial examples for the human visual system, after all. We call them optical illusions, and they feel weird to look at. In this image, we can feel our sensory interpretation of the scene flipping between three alternatives, a little box in front of a big one, a box in a corner, and a box missing one. And in this Munker illusion, there's something scintillating, undeniably, about the color of the dots, 
which of course are all the same. So if we design convolutional neural networks with recurrence, they could exhibit such behavior as well, which maybe doesn't sound like such a great thing. Like let's make our image classifiers vacillating and uncertain, capable of oscillations. But it's our ability to hem and haw and reconsider our own perceptions on many levels that gives our perceptual system such tremendous robustness. Paradoxically, being able to second guess ourselves allows us greater confidence in our predictions. We are doing science in every moment, the very cells of our brain continuously refining a hypothesis about the state of the world, which gives us a tremendous ability to adopt and operate within an extreme range of circumstances, even when we are tripping face or while we're asleep. Two, dreams. These are not real people. These are the photos of fake celebrities dreamt up by a generative adversarial network, a pair of networks which are particularly creative. The networks get better through continuous mutual refinement. And it works like this. <clears throat> On the one side, we have the creator. This is a deep learning network, not unlike Inception, but trained to run in reverse. This network we feed with noise, literally a random vector of numbers, and it learns to generate images. But how does it learn? It has no way to learn. In technical parlance, it lacks a gradient without another network, without the adversary. The adversary is an image classifier, like Inception, but trained on only two classes, real and fake. Its job is to distinguish the creator's forgeries from true faces. So this network we feed with the ground truth, with actual examples of faces of actual celebrities, and the adversary learns. And then we use those results to train the creator. If its forgeries go undetected, it's doing well. But if they're caught, we backpropagate the failure so that it can learn. Now I should tell you the technical terms for these networks are the generator and discriminator. I changed them because names are important and powerful and also meaningless. They don't change the structure of the training methodology, which is incredibly powerful. This is a semi-supervised learning technique because we haven't gone and labeled every possible image or even a subset of images that the generator could generate and said, this is plausible, this one is implausible. That would be a very difficult task. Instead, we have this process of recursive co-training in which two circuits play a game, ruminating on a space of possibilities and learning to extract maximum value from a relatively small data set. And this is a process that might be helpful for neural circuits of all kinds though it does have some quirks. GANs are not particularly great at global structure. This is a fallout cow. It has grown a cow with an extra body, just as you may have spent a night wandering around a house that is your house, but with many extra rooms. And these networks are not really that great at counting either. This is a seven-eyed monkey. So do something for me. Next time you think you're awake, which is presumably now, count your fingers, just to be sure. And if you find that you have more or fewer than you expected, please don't wake up just yet, because we're not quite done. Another interesting facet of this training methodology is that the generator is being fed noise, just literally a vector of noise, some point in a high dimensional space. So it learns a mapping from that space onto its generation target, which in this case is faces. And if we take a point in that space and just drag it around, we get this, <clears throat> which is also pretty trippy, you know? This, this resembles the kinds of things that I have seen, that someone who isn't me has seen on acid. This resembles the kinds of things that you may have seen in a long forgotten dream. Now, I don't have a magic school bus voyage to take us on to understand why that is. 
But I do have a theory. When we see a face, a bunch of neurons in our brain light up and begin resonating a signal, which is the feeling of seeing that particular face. Taken together, all of the neurons implicated in face detection produce a vector embedding, a mapping from faces to positions in some high dimensional space. Oops. And as we drag around the generator's vector here, so are we dragging around our own, a novel and unsettling sensation. So that's a wild theory, but it's not totally without neurocognitive precedent. <clears throat> so here we have a rat in a cage. We've hooked up an electrode to a particular neuron in the rat's brain, and those pink dots are the locations where it fires. If we speed it up, slowly we will see a pattern start to emerge. So this neuron is a grid cell, so named because the centers of its firing fields produce a triangular grid. There's a lot of grid cells in your brain, each aligning to a different grid. They seem to collect data from your visual system and from head direction cells, which similarly encode the position of your head. And together, they construct an encoding, a vector embedding of our position in 2D Euclidean space. This is operating even in our sleep. If earlier you discovered that you are actually dreaming and you want to see the end of this talk, which you should, but you're having a bit of trouble staying in it, Oneronauts recommends spinning your body around, your dream body. This is because your physical body is not spinning, and so it detaches your perceived body, the one with 12 fingers and several extra bedrooms, from your physical one, which is lying in bed. So this positioning system is something which, on some level, you always knew existed. After all, you know where you are in space. You have a sense of space as you move through it. And it's likely, necessary even, if we believe that cognition is computation, that our qualitative sense of space has some neurocognitive precursor, a signal in the web that tells us where we're at, in many senses of the word. Part three, sticks and stones. They say you can't tickle yourself because you know it's coming. Specifically, when your brain sends an action command to your muscles, it's called an efference. When an efference is sent, your brain makes a copy. Now, makes a copy sounds very planned, sort of engineered. Your brain is this big, evolved signal processing mesh. And so another way to think of efference copies is as reflections. <clears throat> so, we take the efference and send it to our peripheral nerves, where it will presumably make some muscles contract. Meanwhile, from the efference copy, we predict how our body's state is going to change. And then we use that to update our brain's model of our body's state. If we didn't do this, then we would have to wait for sense data to come back to tell us what happened. Where exactly is my hand right now? And then we face the same problem as trying to play a twitchy video game over a crap connection. Signals take 10 milliseconds to travel from our brain to our periphery and about 10 milliseconds to travel back. It's just not that low latency or high bandwidth of this nervous system of ours. And so to enable smooth, coordinated movements, our brain has to make predictions. So life goes on. But in a moment, we have a problem because we still receive that sense data from our nerves. It didn't go anywhere. And if we update our models again, then they would actually fall out of sync. And so this signal, we have to attenuate and keep the model in sync. This applies even to our sense of touch when that touch is an expected consequence of our own movement. This is obviously a really complicated model. And aspects of it are likely distributed throughout our brain. But there is one place that is particularly important in maintaining it, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is quite special. All action commands from the brain to the body route through it. And all sensations from the body to the brain as well. 
It has long been recognized as vitally important to motor coordination, like this. People with cerebellar damage have difficulty performing this action smoothly. So with cerebellar damage, our movements become jerky and laggy. It's been theorized that the cerebellum acts as a Smith predictor, our brain's controller for our latency-distant bodies, able to estimate the body's current state and integrate sensory data to keep that model up to date and decompose gross actions generated elsewhere in the brain into a continuously varying fine-tuned control signal. And once you've evolved it, such a thing has many uses. And there's a growing body of evidence implicating the cerebellum in language, which does make sense. Utterance is a kind of movement, and language, she said, pacing and gesticulating wildly, is not limited to utterance. The work of moving words is not so different from the work of moving the body. They are both transformations from the source of internal states, efferents, and ideas to the external world of sensations and world coordinates and other people. What happens when this predictor encounters a problem, when there's an irreconcilable discontinuity in the model? These things are not so very different. They're visceral and guttural. They shake our bones. And jokes, too, are shaped like trauma. They're both shatterings. They're illuminations of discontinuities, paradoxes, which cannot be and yet somehow are. Things which we must revisit again and again, our minds churning, trying to smooth the edges of cutting stone, the machinery of our brains trying to make sense of a world that resists it. Preparing this talk was a difficult time for me. I wasn't sure I could do it. The world appears to be falling apart. I got dumped, which definitely didn't help. There were days when I would open my email and every subject line would be a stone and I would think to sew them onto my dress and wade out into the sea. But I didn't because I remembered that I am a process of creation. I am a song singing myself. We are stories telling ourselves, a sea understanding itself, the churning of our waves creating every moment of exquisite joy and every moment of exquisite suffering and everything else. It's you. You are everything. Everything you have ever seen and every place you have ever been and every song you have ever sung, and every God you have ever prayed to and every person you have ever loved and the space between you and them and the stars and the sea is all in your head. Thank you. <laughs>